Hi, and welcome to a, a sunny version of uh, Here Now the News, right in my face. Um, I want to uh, welcome you. Hi, I'm Jerry Barmash, and today we're going to talk about uh, Jews. Uh, Anti-Semitism has been, you know, just rampant lately. Uh, but we're going to not only look to the future; we're going to look uh, a lot at the past, uh, especially on Long Island, with an expert. Uh, he is the founder of the uh, Long Island Jewish Historical Society. I hope I have that name right. Uh, and it is uh, pretty close. It's Jewish Historical Society of Long Island. Jewish Historical Society of Long Island. All the words just in different order. Uh, and Brad Kolodny is with me uh, today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Jerry. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, we've spoken a few times for my uh, day job, Patch, uh, in coordination with the the Holocaust, uh, Holocaust Memorial, the uh, learning, what is it? The Holocaust Museum, basically, in Nassau uh, County. Um, right. the, uh, and you you work with them a lot, but you also have, do you have a, your own uh, location? So we uh, started a year in it. The Jewish Historical Society of Long Island was formed in June of 2021. And we uh, do not currently have a uh, physical office or a location other than the current exhibit that we have on display at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center in Glen Cove that you referred to. So we do have a partnership with them in that uh, they have offered us exhibit space and we have set up an exhibit there that opened on October 2nd called Earning a Living, 300 Years of Jewish Businesses on Long Island. And uh, it's uh, a great opportunity for us to have a physical presence, a display of artifacts, of photographs, of stories, a self-guided tour that uh, people can come and, and experience and learn about Jewish businesses over the last three centuries. And I want to talk about that. But as we've seen in these, as we're recording this, but it, it doesn't matter as we're recording it because it's it's so uh, so much in the news, uh, whether it's Kanye West or Nick Fuentes. Uh, there, there have been so many stories lately uh, about anti-Semitism. How important is this exhibit and others that that you've been doing? And I know you're you're an author as well. How important is it to go back uh to look at where Jew Jews have come and Jewish life has has gotten to while we're seeing where things are uh in in such a bad way how, how important is the uh this this dichotomy well I do think it's important from an educational standpoint any breaking down barriers and having people understand people who they may have a prejudice against, can only be overcome by understanding the other side. And here on Long Island, there has been a lack of understanding or a lack of history taught about Judaism that has existed here, certainly since World War II. And a lot of people know about the presence of Judaism on Long Island after World War II. But the type of things that the Jewish Historical Society and I have dug in to based on the two books that I have written, have really been about the history that came even longer ago. I mean, listen, the fact, uh, the fact is that Jews have been on Long Island since 1705. And when I talk about Long Island, I'm referring to only Nassau and Suffolk counties. Um, and, and, you know, I think just having this information available, you know, that's new, that hasn't been put forward before, can only help in providing an understanding of how long the Jewish community has been here on Long Island. And if it's able to educate others from the outside who may not have an understanding of what Jewish life on Long Island has been about and what it is today, I'm happy to provide you know, that service to, uh, to anyone who's interested in learning more. Of course, that that is always the hard, you know, the harder part, the the uh, delicate balance. You know, the the people who are probably most interested in these exhibits and these books and these uh, uh, stories are going to be the people who 
uh, are impacted by them the most, I would say. So probably the, the Jewish people and certainly from Long Island or, you know, have uh, the, the connections to it would be most uh, receptive to it. I would think, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably the people who, uh, we're, like we're sort of referring to the the anti-Semitic people, the ones who need the understanding are probably not going to be showing up as, as, as readily. Well, I think you're probably right. Um, you know, our mission is to, is to, uh, you know, gather information and artifacts and make them available to educate the general public. Um, I would say that our, uh, target audience is, uh, you know, like you have said, it's it's people who are Jewish, people who have lived on Long Island or currently live on Long Island, and those people who are interested in learning about Long Island Jewish history. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to make it sound like our mission is aimed at combating anti-Semitism. There are certainly a lot of groups who are set up for that purpose explicitly. Uh, Jewish Historical Society is set up to, um, you know, spread information and, uh, you know, document the history that has existed on Long Island uh, that hasn't existed before. And, you know, we've, I've, I've been speaking to many groups over several years um, and actually was at the uh, Holocaust Memorial Intolerance Center yesterday uh, speaking and presenting to a group from COMAC, a Hadassah group from COMAC that, you know, was interested in learning about our local Jewish history. And so uh, we organized an event, a day at the center, and uh, it was it was really a great, uh, a great event for all who attended. And as you say, even if you're looking at just the Jew, and it, of course, anybody can show up, no matter religion, no matter race, no matter, you know, gender, anybody can show up. Uh, but uh, again, for even Jews, a lot of people are not aware, like you said, that the Jewish uh, heritage goes back to 1705. And, the, you know, there's a lot of, as you said, a lot of education to this. What, what else uh, do, do you, is there anything that people will get? And I'm sure they'll get a, you know, a lot of learning, but is there anything more that you want people to take away from it? Absolutely. Yeah. I want them to, uh, you know, have pride in their Jewish community and pride in the history that has existed. Um, you know, one of the first projects for the Jewish Historical Society of Long Island was to dedicate a historic marker in front of the first synagogue ever built on Long Island. Now, I've spoken to several groups over the last couple of years, and one of the questions I always ask is, where was the first synagogue on Long Island built? And 99%, 99.9% of the people don't know the answer to that question. If I ask somebody where the first synagogue or what's the oldest synagogue in the United States, I think a lot of people would know the Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island is the oldest synagogue in the United States. But people just don't have the same knowledge and understanding about Jewish history on Long Island. So we erected a marker in front of the first synagogue built on Long Island, which was in Setauket. That synagogue opened in 1896. So in September of 2021, we celebrated the 125th anniversary of that synagogue being built. And to take this point one step further, I think you know there's a reason why Jewish history on Long Island has been overlooked for so long. And I think it's due to the fact that Long Island is seen more or less as an outgrowth of New York City. And today, Long Island is the fourth largest Jewish community in the United States with over 300,000 residents. Um, fourth coming after New York City, Los Angeles, and Southern Florida. Hmm. So I think people have seen Long Island as just an outgrowth of New York City, but the fact of the matter is we have a unique history. We have uh, individuals who came to Long Island for very specific reasons. And that has created, uh, you know, over the decades, a, a great history that is important to be told. And just the fact that most people don't know about it, the, the first synagogue on Long Island, it's just one example of 
the Jewish history that is interesting and that, uh, you know, I'm happy to share. I was going to, I didn't know if you were going to let me guess. I was thinking like the Hamptons. I, I was going to go farther out. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you want, I can throw out an anecdote about the Hamptons because. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the first synagogue built in Setauket in 1896. That building is no longer being used as a synagogue. It's actually owned by the Setauket United Methodist Church, and they use it as a thrift store. However, there is a synagogue in Sag Harbor that opened in 1900, and that synagogue is still in existence today. That congregation still operates out of that same building. So Temple Adas Israel in Sag Harbor has the distinction of being the oldest continuously used synagogue building on Long Island. It opened in 1900, and it is still in use today. Now, you might wonder, you know, why Sag Harbor? And, and for that reason, for that matter, why Setauket? They're very similar in that in the late 1800s, there were factories located, a rubber factory in Setauket and a watch case factory in Sag Harbor. Both of these factories needed both manual and skilled labor, and they would seek immigrants to come and work at those factories. And many Jewish immigrants who were immigrating to the United States around the time that these factories were just starting in the late 19th century were drawn to come out to a place that they have probably never heard of. But the fact is they were offered a salary. They were offered a place to live. Both of those companies offered c corporate housing. Well, it's called corporate housing. They, they offered a place where you could, where your family could come and live. And that was attractive enough of a reason for Jews as well as other, uh, you know, Italian and Irish immigrants to come out to those areas. But this was the formation of the first Jewish communities on Long Island because you had Jews coming out to these certain areas to work in factories, and that's where they ended up living. So you had Setauket 1896, Sag Harbor 1900, and you also had a, a lace mill in Patchogue, which caused a synagogue to be built there, in 1904. Wow, I I I, I love the the history and the, the anecdote. It's amazing. The you, you said like if it would be its own city, Long Island would be the fourth largest uh, Jewish community in the country. Is that is that today or is that from pre today? That's yeah. today. But yeah. are the numbers of Jews are the, have they been leaving Long Island? Is it, it it has it has it been a change? I mean, we're certainly seeing on the political. Uh, landscape that, um, you know, the Republicans and, and the more right wing, not that we have to get into that, but certainly uh, more leaning uh, toward Republican and not necessarily Jewish and or or at least not the, you know, those would be more the uh, the religious Jewish and the Orthodox. And I'm not sure if you're seeing that as much um, in, in any event. Is, is that a change in these last several years? No doubt about it. I mean, there, there are trends that come and go. There are ebbs and flows in population. Um, and I will say there are certainly people who are leaving Long Island, Jewish people who are leaving Long Island. However, 300,000 is still a significant number. Sure. And I think what we're seeing now and, and some of the biggest changes that are happening in synagogue life and the existence of synagogue buildings is the fact that younger Jews are not affiliating with synagogues the way their parents and their grandparents did. People are still Jewish, but they may not be joining synagogues. And when people aren't, when, when the younger generation is not replacing the older generation that is either moving away or unfortunately, but the reality is that they're dying off, the congregations and the synagogues need to have their membership replenished. And if the younger generation is not joining a synagogue, then you have problems. And that's when, you know, you have a, a considerable number of synagogue closures and mergers. And this is the current trend that is happening, particular in, particularly in the conservative and the reform movement, whereas the Orthodox seems to be growing more in certain areas, including the five towns. Uh, in the southern part of western Nassau County and Great Neck, 
uh, in the uh, western part of northern Nassau County. Do you think, as we kind of alluded to with the different uh, Trump rallies and uh, uh, Stop the Steal rallies and stuff that we've been seeing for the last five or six years, um, and and obviously the anti-Semitism that has been on the rise, are are Jews fearing their safety and, and are they leaving Long Island because of that? It's hard for me to, to say. And, uh, you know, if you leave, if you're Jewish and you leave Long Island, does that mean you're not going to face anti-Semitism where you end up living? Uh, I would be surprised if, if that was causing people to, to leave Long Island. I think they're leaving Long Island for economic reasons. I think they're leaving Long Island because of age. Um, I, I wouldn't say people are leaving Long Island due to anti-Semitism because it exists everywhere. Right. And, uh, you know, this is not a, a trend that that I've seen happening. Right. Well, I want to ask you about your background. We know you, you as you mentioned, you had two books. I want to touch on that. But what, what's your background to get to where we are today? Well, it's interesting because I am not, not a writer by trade, um, but I was a photographer in college. And the first book that I wrote, Seeking Sanctuary, 125 Years of Synagogues on Long Island, is a documentation of Jewish houses of worship in Nassau and Suffolk County, both past and present. So it's a completely comprehensive look at every single building that has been used as a synagogue. And so the first one being in 1896 and now continuing to today, um, the book, you know, I went and photographed every single building. Um, and so it, it, it was a significant project for me from a photography standpoint. And I was able to draw on my uh, background as a photographer in college. But of course, it also entailed doing a lot of research in terms of where these synagogues are located um, to find them, but also giving a little bit of background on when the congregation started, when the synagogue was built, you know, what were some of the significant milestones that make one congregation different from another. Um, I, I guess you can say I have become a writer because I've now published a second book just this year, came out in March called The Jews of Long Island, 1705 to 1918. And the uh, objective for that book was trying to dispel the myth that Jews only came to Long Island after World War II. There's no question that the population grew tremendously in a very short amount of time once men were coming back from, from, from the war and they were leaving uh, you know, the city uh, at very large numbers. But through the research that I've done, I've been able to uh, determine that there were over 4,000 Jews that were living on Long Island even before the end of World War I. And by 1918, there were already 13 congregations, 13 synagogues that had existed on Long Island. So the history goes back much, for, much farther than 1945. And uh, it's, just, it's just so interesting to me, all the stories that I uncovered finding out why people moved to Long Island, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I already mentioned about the factories, and that was a significant draw. But there were people who moved out to Long Island to be peddlers, to be merchants, open up a store. Um, there were farmers, uh, dairy farmers. There was a, a Jewish duck farmer in Santa Mariches uh, in 1909 uh, named Harry Bernstein. Uh, there were, uh, you know, farmers who grew, you know, standard crops. Um, so there are a number of different reasons, and everyone had their own reasons for seeking, uh, you know, a better life uh, on Long Island. And, uh, you know, the book is just full of those kinds of, of unique stories. And that, and that became the exhibit that you have going on, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Through the, what happened was in doing research for the book, about the Jews of Long Island, 1705 to 1918, I spoke with many descendants uh, of people who actually came. So you have the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of people who moved from New York City East to start a life for their families on Long Island. 
And when I would interview these people, not only would they tell me the stories, but they would say, here's, here's a document, here's a photograph, here's an item from, from my great grandfather's business. I don't know what to do with these things. And being that the Jewish Historical Society exists, I would ask if they would be interested in donating these items. In a lot of cases, people were. And that is what has made up the exhibit. So you can go to the exhibit and see items from the uh, pickle factory that existed in East Northport beginning in 1914. And there was an ice manufacturing business in Amityville in, in the 1890s. Uh, the gentleman there, his name was Jacob Hartman. And we have from his great, great grandchildren, some of the items that were used to manufacture ice. There's an ice saw and there are tongs that carry these large blocks of ice. So, so to have these artifacts, to be able to tell these stories, to bring it all together in this way has just been really rewarding. And the feedback that I've gotten from people who have visited has been extremely positive. So it's all been very rewarding for me. And it's vital because so many people we've seen in books and certainly in documentaries uh, about the the Jewish immigrant coming to the United States, coming to the East Coast, coming to New York. And we've seen those um, the shots of the peddlers and, and the almost like a ghetto on the Lower East Side. Uh, Absolutely. Or, or Anybody the... can tell you about the Lower East Side. <laughs> Anybody can tell you about growing up along the Grand Concourse in the Bronx or in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. There are so many people who know those stories, but why hasn't Long Island's story been told? Now it has. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, you, you know, you took the time. How did you decide? I, you know, you said the photography, but how did you decide to, to make that move and to, to photograph the uh, synagogues? Yeah, it's a great question. I did not set out to write a book. Um, in 2015, so almost eight years ago, or, or almost nine years ago, no, seven years ago, almost no. eight years ago, yeah. um, my synagogue, the synagogue I belong to, uh, Midway Jewish Center in Syosset, was undergoing a renovation of the sanctuary. Um, and the night before the demolition, I went in to take photographs of the way things were at that point in time. You know, I, I contemplated everything that's lost when you transform a sacred space down to the floorboards and the wall studs, and who is going to remember, you know, what Midway Jewish Center was like before this renovation took place. Then I started to think about it in a larger context. What memories have already been lost on Long Island from synagogues that don't even exist anymore? Who is going to remember these things? And so I went home, I, I went online, I started doing a little research to see if somebody had already been documenting this. And the fact was that nobody had. So in 2015, I started a, uh, an Instagram page called Synagogues of Long Island. And I basically started going uh, first, you know, around my house to, to uh, you know, different communities, whether it was in uh, Syosset, Plainview, Woodbury, Westbury, Jericho. And then it just kind of branched out and grew from there. And the fact that nobody had been documenting Jewish history on Long Island, um, it just said to me that I need to do something here. So, um, so that first book came out. It took me four years to photograph every single building that still stands on Long Island that was used as a synagogue. And I also acquired additional photographs of buildings that no longer stand. Uh, you know, there were synagogues that were lost in a fire. There were synagogues that were torn down to make room for a new structure. Um, and I acquired uh, a lot of those photographs as well to, to make the book fully comprehensive. And then I guess the second book, um, you know, the impetus there was driven by COVID, to be quite honest. Um, in March of 2020, I knew that I wasn't going to be commuting to my job in Manhattan and I would have extra time on my hands. So I started doing research instead of into the synagogue buildings that I've, I had already done. I was now doing a deep dive into the Jewish people and who came and why they came. And, and that uncovered all the things that some of we've discussed and, and, and a whole lot more. 
So it's really been a calling for you for several years. I guess you could say that. Yeah, it, it, it kind of uh, it kind of came to me in 2015. That's when this journey started. Uh, the first book came out in 2019. The Jewish Historical Society was formed in 2021. The second book came out in 2022. Um, and so, you know, a number of a number of things to to look forward to in the future, like the exhibit at uh, the Holocaust Center, where we will be changing out the items in the exhibit and creating a new exhibit come uh, April of 2023. Oh, do we, can you say what that is? Uh, it's still under wraps. It's still in development, um, okay. but we will be having a new exhibit uh, in that location uh, come the spring. And the current one is going until when? Until the end of March. Until the end of March. Okay. Yes. Well, do you see at some point that, that you will have your own, you know, I don't brick and mortar, but your own location? I certainly hope so. And and if you're willing to pony up the money to to find a home for us, Jerry, I'm happy to listen. <laughs> um, no, listen, it, 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 it takes a lot of work. Um, it is a labor of love for me that is not a full-time job. Everything that I've mentioned so far uh, that we've spoken about has been just in my spare time. I do have a full-time job and, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, something that certainly keep, keeps me busy on the side uh, that I love doing. And I hope it's something that will continue for, for many, many years to come. And, you know, operating out of our own location would certainly be a goal, but there's a long way to go before we get there. And what's your full-time job? Do you want to talk about that? Uh, I am employed at the New York Times. Uh, I am not a writer. I do work on the business side in uh, advertising. Oh, so well, you, I'm in I'm in media. So it's sort of a well, it's a journalistic end anyway. Even if it's not a, it's a writer, it's still right. Know, it's a it's, it's a journalistic pursuit. I feel on my end, um, side hustle, if you will, that is not associated or affiliated with what I do at the New York Times. Interesting. Uh, Brad Kolodny. Again, he uh, is the founder of the Jewish Historical Society of Long Island, uh, author of two books, and uh, I, I, great to chat with you. I uh, appreciate it. Hope we can do it again sometime. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate you having me on, and uh, we'll speak again soon. Thank you. All the best to you. Thanks. Thanks.